Uh, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is it? We wait until it's 30. <laughs> we wait until it's 16:30. Uh, <laughs> Can I try screen share? Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, we continue, and the first talk is by Masanori Hanada, and he will speak about the flux tube and chiral symmetry breaking in the parity deconfined phase of Young Mills theory. Uh, yes, can I? Uh, okay, now I can share my screen, I think. So now you're seeing PDF file, I suppose. Could I tell you when it's like 10 minutes till can, the end? Okay, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? May I start? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. So this is a uh, title of my talk. And this talk is based on a series of papers, actually many papers. And I want to talk about the last two papers which appeared recently. But uh, for that, I have to introduce some uh, uh, notion, partially confined phase, uh, which are established in these papers. And actually, I uh, explained the notion of a partial deconfinement last year in this conference. But uh, I suppose many of you were not there. And even if you were there after one year, I'm sure you forgot. So let me spend maybe half or maybe a bit more of the time for explaining the first uh, uh, what I explained already last year, and then I will add the new result. So I will uh, talk about confinement, the confinement transition. And you would say there are two phases in large finite temperature, large energy theory, confined phase and the confined phase. But I want to argue that there is uh, some intermediate phase, which we call the partially confined, partially deconfined phase. Partial confinement and the partial deconfinement are the same thing. Okay, we can use this, uh, these two uh, words interchangeably. And to understand why partially confined phase appear, it's useful to uh, understand the relationship between confinement in large energy theory and the Bose-Einstein condensation. Confinement is analogous to superfluid, and the confinement is a normal fluid. It may sound a bit uh, Vague, but uh, you will understand. And then, based on uh, this, I will explain uh, a new result related to flux tube and the color symmetry breaking. So, let me start the uh, first part. So, in a large energy theory, we can distinguish confined phase and the confined phase by uh, looking at the dependence of energy E or entropy S on the size of gauge group N. In confined phase, we cannot see individual color. So energy scales like n to the zero up to zero point energy, and the entropy scales like n to the zero. And in this picture, I meant n by n matrix, like a gauge field. And I use a blue color to mean that nothing is excited. Okay, so no degrees of freedom, it's kind of no degrees of freedom is excited. And I use blue because it's nothing is excited, so it's very cold. In deconfined phase, individual colors become visible, sort of. That would mean uh, energy or entropy scales like n square, because n square color degrees of freedom are unlocked. So in this picture, I used red to show it's very hot. So n square degrees of freedom are unlocked, they're excited, and it's very hot. So I used the red color. And this kind of uh, characterization is kinematical. And it's very useful because uh, it works even for weak coupling a small volume. And uh, there is good reason to believe that such kinematical characterization is related to more dynamical features, like a formation of flux tube in confined sector. But uh, uh, there is good reason, but it's not uh, uh, obvious. Okay. 
And uh, I have only the collaborators did the weak up, weak uplink analysis and obtained some exact result. And they uh, pointed out three basic patterns of phase diagram associated with the confinement, the confinement phase transition. First, they studied the free limit of young males. And they found that just this blue part is confined phase. This red part is the confined phase. And uh, this direction is temperature. This direction is energy or product of loop. And between this uh, confined, the confined phase and the confined phase, they found some intermediate phase, which I did not buy orange. And if you introduce some uh, non-trivial matter content or finite coupling, then uh, this line can be tilted to this direction or this direction. And then it can become a stable intermediate phase or unstable saddle, which separates to minima of free energy. In this picture, this dotted line is a free energy maximum, which is unstable phase. But when volume is small, uh, when the space-time volume is small, this such intermediate phase may be stable in a microcanonical treatment. And in large volume, even in microcanonical ensemble, such phase is unstable. But uh, uh, this unstable saddle is smoothly uh, connected to stable saddle if you change parameters like clock mass or number of forever divided by number of color. So understanding uh, the property of this uh, unstable saddle still has uh, important meaning. Okay, and in terms of the Prakov line phase, so we can have a Prakov loop, which is a holonomy wrapped on a temporal, dire temporal direction. Okay, and in large energy theory, we have N phases. And N is, when N is infinite, we can imagine a continuous distribution of the phases. And in confined phase, distribution is just uniform. So the height is like just one over two pi. And in this orange phase, intermediate phase, the distribution is not uniform, but they so it's everywhere non-zero. And in this red part, it's in the confined phase, we it, distribution is not just uniform, but we have gap here. Okay, and uh, when theory has a center symmetry, okay, both of them break center symmetry. So in that sense, they are both deconfined phase. But uh, there is phase transition in between. So there are two kinds of deconfined phases if we use the center symmetry uh, to characterize the confinement and deconfinement. And for some historical reason, we call this phase transition as a Hagedron transition, this phase transition as a gross witte transition. And in, when they wrote the paper, they showed that there are it's some intermediate phase. But the physical meaning wasn't really clear. And I want to uh, show that this physical meaning is partial confinement, or equivalently partial deconfinement. So our claim is that uh, this uniform distribution corresponds to this com com completely confined phase. So no degrees of freedom is excited. And this uh, uh, gapped distribution corresponds to completely confined phase. But this partial the partially the confined phase is something in between. Some color degrees of freedom are excited, and the rest are not. Okay, so in the space of color, the confined sector and confined sector coexist. And in terms of uh, uh, gauge gravity duality, when we have dual gravity interpretation, confined sector would correspond to something like vacuum radius. The confined uh, phase would correspond to large black hole, which is uh, almost completely filling bark. But this partially deconfined phase would correspond to small black hole. And uh, the existence of big confined sector would mean that uh, a lot of uh, uh, significant fraction of the bark uh, is uh, outside the horizon. And uh, uh, you know we have some space time here. And we can uh, also draw analogy to uh, uh, the case of, uh, of our, uh, water, for example. And if we have a water, if we put the water in the freezer, below zero Celsius, we get ice, solid water. Above zero Celsius, we have a liquid water. But at exactly zero temperature, we see the coexistence of liquid and solid. And in this case, the separation to liquid phase and the solid phase 
takes place in a usual physical space. But here I'm saying that uh, such splitting to two sectors can take place in a space of color. And the furthermore, important thing is that we have this very clean structure. So uh, they can find the degrees of freedom or not really like a scattered like this, or it's not like all degrees of freedom are mildly excited. Only part of the degrees are excited and they have this specific block structure. Okay, so this is uh, uh, something uh, rather different from this uh, case of you know, uh, water. And the mechanism that such a very clean pattern appears is the same as both side condensation, as I will explain shortly. Is there any question so far? Can I go? Can I proceed? Yes, please continue. Ah, okay. So, you know, I want to explain that phenomenon, partial deconfinement, by using a, a similarity, a expl explain partial deconfinement by uh, using a similarity between Bose-Einstein condensation and confinement at larger. And actually, historically, the first example of non abelian jelly theory was <laughs> studied not by Ian and Wills, but in retrospect, Bose and Einstein in a sense, I will explain, they consider the first example of non abelian gauge theory without noticing that. And the system they studied was uh, an indistinguishable bosons. To understand that, we have to understand how a partial function of gauge theory can be expressed in terms of a Hilbert space. So let's consider finite temperature partial function. Then we take a trace of exponential minus Hamiltonian over T. Okay, and typically we have a, a trace over gauge invariant Hilbert space because uh, we say that physical state is gauge invariant. But actually there is equivalent way of expressing this partial function using extended Hilbert space, which contains gauge non invariant state. There we have a, a gauge group G which is a SN permutation in the case of indistinguishable bosons, or SUN in the case of matrix modular YAMLs. Okay, and this G hat is acting on this extended Hilbert space. And we take uh, uh, integral over all group element using hard measure. Then uh, uh, G hat integrated over group G gives a projection from extended Hilbert space to invariant Hilbert space. And actually, if you, in the case of the Yamlinger theory, for example, if you start with a, uh, if you start with a path integral formalism, then uh, if you relate uh, uh, path integral to uh, operator formalism by using the standard uh, technique introduced by Feynman, actually this is what you get first. And actually, this G hat is product of loop. Okay, correspond to product of loop degrees of freedom in a path integral formalism. Because in path integral formalism, typically we try to, uh, ah, sorry, I didn't say, but here in you know, operator formalism, we're using AT equals to zero gauge. But we cannot really fix AT to zero in a literal sense. If we, if, uh, in the case of a finite temperature, for example, if we try to fit, uh, fix AT to zero from T equals to zero, then, uh, you know, if there is an imaginary circle and uh, we can set AT to zero all the way except at the fi uh, final point. And we have to insert product of group degrees of freedom, which cannot be fixed. And this integration over G hat corresponds to integration over product of group degrees of freedom. And uh, let's use this formalism to a system of N uh, indistinguishable bosons. Okay, in that case, extended Hilbert space is just a, a Fox space and uh, uh, Gauge group is a SN permutation in the sense I explained shortly. So let's consider N bosons in three dimensional harmonic potential. The Hamiltonian is just uh, H hat equals to P square plus X square. And there are N particles. So we have index I here, and I runs from one to N. And each X hat and P hat are three vector. So there are three uh, coordinates and the three momenta. 
And the SN permutation symmetry exchanges this uh, label I. And we are talking about an indistinguishable bosons. So when we uh, exchange the index I and J, as a quad, uh, uh, we cannot distinguish uh, such states. So in that sense, this is a gauged SN permutation group. And extended Hilbert space is just a Fock state. So anyone N1 there is a N1 consists of uh, three numbers N1x, N1y, N1z, which ex, which corresponds to the excitation, excitation level of x hat one, x y hat one, z hat one. Okay, and so we have a three vector to label the excitation level of each particle, and we have n three vectors. Okay, and the Fock state can be uh, written this way in a very standard manner. And this uh, spans, these focus states span uh, extended Hilbert space. You know, when n are different, clearly they are not invariant under a same permutation. And if you want to uh, project it to invariant Hilbert space, you just you take the uh, linear combination such that the uh, 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 wave function is totally undecent, uh, totally symmetric. Okay. And by using this expression, partition function, is that this uh, as volume of gauge group becomes uh, one over n factorial. n factorial is, is number of elements in SN permutation. And this integral over group element becomes a sum over permutation. And this is trace over extended Hilbert space. Okay. And this sigma hat. Uh, it's a group element which acts uh, this uh, uh, as a permutation of n uh, particle. And then uh, this is free uh, Hamiltonian. So this uh, exponential acting on this just gives uh, some, you know, some of the uh, excitation level. And this sigma hat acts on uh, as a permutation. Okay. And let me exchange the ordering of this sum. And this combination is very important. This combination measures the amount of redundancy. And Einstein, it was actually 100 years ago, Einstein went to Kyoto. And he was there for a few, only a few days. So I'm not really sure if he went to this famous uh, sightseeing spot. But uh, at least I think he heard about the uh, rumor about this you know, very popular sightseeing place, I'm sure. So he learned about the system of 1001 identical Buddhas. And if this is a nice place, you should go if you go to Kyoto. And if you see this, you know, for sure you would want to understand the consequence of the indistinguishability of the many particles. So Einstein spent more than one year to understand the implication of this indistinguishability of uh, Buddhas. And then he found the answer in 1924. That was Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay, so here, if we have ground state, in ground state, all the excitation levels are zero. Then no permutation can change the state. So all the permutation contribute to the sum and we get n factorial from here. But if we imagine generically excited state, imagine that all NRIs are different from N other energies. So all Ns are different. Then only sigma equals the identity can keep this in a product non-zero. So we get only factor one. Okay, so ground state somehow has huge enhancement compared to generically excited state. And what happens in intermediate energy scale? In intermediate energy scale, if excitation is pushed to some of the particles and you know many of them remains ground state, if it happens, then this part gives this huge enhancement factor. So rather than you know distributing the energy to all the bosons, actually, because of this enhancement factor naturally energy is distributed to only part of the bosons and many of them remain in a ground state. This is Bose-Einstein condensation. 
Okay. And this Sigma hat <laughs> is a Polakov loop in a system of uh, 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 and indistinguishable bosons. And this enhancement factor for generic gauge group and the generic kilobyte space can be phrased as a, a volume of a stabilizer of the quantum state phi. And then once we see this, uh, that this has to appear is clear. It's almost straightforward. So in the case of BC or partially Bose-Einstein condensate phase, many degrees of freedom remains a grand state was zero, so that this enhancement factor appears because SN permutation acting on this part doesn't change the state. So we want to have a big stabilizer. Okay, so that for that purpose, many uh, uh, bosons has to go to ground state. And in the case of a matrix model, Wyamir theory, if we have this structure, SU n minus m acting on this part leaves this state invariant. So we can have a gigantic enhancement factor by pushing all excitation to this small block. Okay, and this picture clearly looks uh, non-gauge invariant, but it's fine because we are using the extended Hilbert space. And you know, any embedding of SUN equivalent. And if we have SUN minus M as a stabilizer of such state, the enhancement factor is exponentially large. This is a reason that the excitation goes, uh, forms some specific block structure. And uh, when we have a gravity dual, we can uh, understand this deconfined sector as extended bound state of strings and deep brain. And this is, in many cases, black hole. OK, so this is a reason why such specific structure appears. Nothing like this is favored. And then. Uh, we can easily understand how Polyakov loop phase is related to such structure. Okay, imagine, so this is a definition of a partial function, and imagine that this trace is uh, uh, represented by some typical state. If you want to have more uh, uh, precise discussion, we can uh, you know, make a discussion more precise, but the result is the same. So just use a typical state here. Okay, and we still have the integral over uh, group element here. Okay, and this inner product is non-zero if this g hat acting on g hat acting on this typical state is the same as this typical state. So if this g hat doesn't change this typical state, then uh, such g hat dominates, and the uh, Prokofiev loop phase distribution is dominated by such g hat which doesn't change this typical state. But then what would be the G hat? So about the confined sector, we cannot have an arbitrary element. It's essentially, uh, we have only one acting on here. But uh, this block can be any gauge group, uh, any element of uh, SU n minus n. And the generic, uh, generic element of SU n minus m gives a completely uniform phase distribution. Or in the case of uh, n identical bosons, S n minus m permutation acting on this part leaves uh, uh, this state invariant. But the typical element of S n minus m permutation gives a uniform phase distribution when n minus m is large. So this part comes from uh, you know here or here. And this uh, non-uniform part comes from this uh, excited part. And actually, if you look at the uh, Feynman's paper from the uh, 1950s, essentially he's saying this. So Feynman's characterization of Bose-Einstein condensation is actually gross weight in wider transition. Gross weight in wider transition would mean that this uh, constant offset disappears, okay? So M becomes uh, N. That's a gross weight wadia transition. And of course, uh, Feynman didn't know Polyakov rule. Feynman didn't know gross weight wadia because it was the 50s. But essentially, he was doing the same thing. So this is the reason why this structure here. OK, and the partially the confined phase, you know, this structure is related to this specific phase distribution. And now I, I want to go to a new part. 
Uh, is there any question so far? Uh, does does not seem so. so okay, for... let, let, let me uh, move on then. Okay, so so far we uh, I uh, didn't uh, explain QCD, but in the case of QCD, in addition to gauge field, which is NC by NC matrix, we have uh, quarks, which is NC times NF vector. Okay, and uh, uh, we we can take NF over NC fixed. Then actually, uh, Schnitzer did weak coupling analysis on uh, when uh, space was a uh, compact phi to S three, and he found that in, in uh, he he found that there is a um, gross unity wadia transition, and somehow although there is no uh, center symmetry, Polyakov loop still characterizes uh, uh, the phase transition. But actually, we can understand it by using uh, the notion of partial confinement. And what we can show is that uh, in, a, in a gauge sector, we, this part is confined, the rest con is confined. In a quark sector, when the chemical potential mu is zero, what happens is uh, part of the quarks are confined, part of the quarks are confined. Okay, And this, this M is the same as this M. And the M is zero ex at exactly zero temperature. And then uh, there is a long, uh, wide region of partially deconfined phase. And this M grows gradually. And uh, toward the end, it grows quickly. And then it reaches uh, NC. And then after that, you know, it doesn't grow. OK, and this point is a gross the value transition. And just reinterpreting the Schnitzer's nice calculation from 2004, we could see this kind of structure. And uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, so what is this y-axis? You say MC, but how can MC we... MC is the size of uh, size of this confined block, and it's related to product of line phases in this uh -huh. way. Uh huh. Yeah. So you define product of line in the in QCD as usual, and uh, yes. of MC from it. Yes, and uh, that yeah, Schnitzer already calculated the <laughs> distribution of product of line phases, so we could just mm -hmm. use his result. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, we could show that this structure actually appeared. I actually we could uh, you know even without using uh, uh, product of line phases, we can uh, check that this such mm -hmm. the confined pattern exists there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And his calculation was uh, so, but Schnitzer's calculation was weak coupling. Okay, so space is compact phi to S3, and he took weak coupling. And then people, uh, you know, many people say, okay, so at weak coupling, you know, this uh, such nice structure uh, exists, but maybe that's because it's weak coupling and the color degrees of freedom are not uh, interacting with each other. And how can you? show that the same is happening at the strong coupling, or how you know more dynamical feature of confinement, like a flux tube, uh, is related to this picture. And that's the reason we uh, try to study flux tube and the color symmetry breaking. First of all, let me uh, remind you that this characterization, based on uh, this uh, enhancement factor, this enhancement factor, this is purely group theoretical argument. It works even for strong coupling. Whether we, we are talking about weak coupling or strong coupling doesn't matter. We can always use this relation, okay? And we can determine M if we numerically calculate uh, phase distribution, okay? And what we did was we performed gauge fixing such that product of loop degrees of freedom splits to deconfined part and confined part. This part gives a constant offset. And this part gives a, a, a non-uniform part. More specifically, we used uh, uh, we used a static di diagonal gauge. And uh, after taking static diagonal gauge, we still have uh, uh, residual permutation symmetry. But we fix permutation symmetry such that this part gives a uniform distribution, and this part gives a non-uniform part. And we can uh, argue that. That is actually the right way of gauge fixing to see this kind of splitting in color space. And we focused on the strong coupling limit of Yamu theory. So uh, 
time direction is continuous, but uh, in a spatial direction, we keep lattice structure and we took strong coupling limit. So it, it's full of that sat fact, but uh, uh, at least uh, qualitatively, it, uh, this model captures uh, uh, confinement, many important features of confinement and confinement transition. And in 1970s, people like uh, Lenny Sasuke used it to uh, establish important notions of uh, associated with the confinement transition. And the strong coupling limit, by assuming that partial deconfinement is actually taking place, we could give some analytic predictions and then we checked it numerically. And at the more technical level, we use the so-called the large volume, large end volume reduction or Eguchikawa equivalence to make simulation easier. And in this specific case, uh, this intermediate phase is actually unstable saddle. So we introduced some constraint to make that unstable saddle stable in the simulation. And in terms of operators, so we have a gauge invariant ground state. And we and the, this is a, a known, uh, uh, this is very basic thing in uh, Kogat Sasuke in the formulation of the lattice gauge theory. And the uh, uh, physical state, uh, state uh, partially confined state can be constructed just by taking u hat, which is a, a link variable. We take link variables in this sector and we make a Wilson loop as a trace of a product of this sector. And we just act on uh, this uh, uh, Wilson loop to this state. Such a state is a partially confined, spans partially confined phase. So, Masanori, you have 10 mm -hmm. minutes. Uh, okay. And uh, in when the confined phase is related, the confined phase can be understood as a condensation of long string. And if long string is uh, condensed in the background, then if we introduce a short uh, string with the quark and anti-quark as endpoint, you know, there is many, inter uh, this uh, short string uh, intersect with the uh, uh, condensed string and then they interact and uh, they can be split uh, uh, without causing, uh, introducing uh, energy. But if there is no string condensed on the background, you know this kind of process cannot take place. And if you, you want to try to separate quark and anti-quark, you have to make a string longer. That's the reason why uh, confinement potential can be seen. But in this picture, if we have a cut quarks from this sector, the confined sector, this can take place. But if we have a quarks in this confined sector, there is no string condensed here. So we see uh, just the same uh, linear confinement potential as confined phase. And this is a result. And we can analytically calculate uh, expected slope here. And we actually reproduce uh, that slope for uh, various different values of m over f. OK, when we look at the two-point function of confined product group, confined product group here. And uh, we can also <laughs> have more complicated uh, uh, an analytic relations, which is not shown, which are not shown here. But we could uh, check all of them. So we actually see that in confined sector fracture is formed. In the confined sector fracture is not formed. And okay, then now we know that in confined sector, quark anti quark pair are confined. Uh, by quark anti anti quark, we see uh, probe quark and the probe anti quark because we are talking about uh, uh, pure Yamas limit. NF is fixed in our treatment. Then what, how about chiral symmetry? So we say that this part is confined. And in this part, quark and anti-quark cannot be se separated. OK? And then we can apply to fourth anomaly matching argument. So fourth anomaly matching say that anomaly has to be conserved. And in a, at high temperature, they can find the phase. Uh, individual quarks can carry anomaly, but once they confine, some other degrees of freedom has to carry anomaly. And if chiral symmetry is broken, then pion can carry the right amount of anomaly. So it's natural to think that uh, uh, chiral symmetry is broken so that anomaly matches. But in this case, this part is deconfined, so quark can carry anomaly. But here, quarks are confined. so Quarks in this sector cannot carry anomaly. Then in order to satisfy anomaly matching in this intermediate energy scale, 
natural uh, uh, possibility is that these color degrees of freedom form chiral condensate, and the chiral symmetry is broken in this sector. Okay, but when once chiral uh, symmetry is uh, uh, formed in this sector, uh, uh, in a usual sense, chiral symmetry is broken. Okay, because chiral symmetry is non-zero, at least for one color. Usually, people don't really imagine that you know some color has non-zero color condensate, some color has zero color condensate. But you know, our hypothesis is that just for this color, color uh, condensate is formed. And then in usual sense, global color symmetry is completely broken once confined sector is formed. That would mean color symmetry breaking point has to be gross width value point. We can check it numerically. This is a, a distribution of, uh, this is a density of eigenvalue of Dirac operator. And we look at the density of zero Dirac density of Dirac eigenvalues at zero. Okay, and if this is non-zero due to uh, Banks cash relation, we expect the non-zero color condensate. And here we can see that border is somewhere peak Polyakov loop equals to 0 0.35. Okay, so when Polyakov loop is large, which means in the confined phase, we see zero density here. But we see quick growth when the uh, product of loop it, it becomes small, which means which go closer to confined phase. And the, the border is somewhere around uh, 0 0.35. <laughs> and this peak of 0 0.35 is exactly gross within value transition. So above gross within value transition, we see non zero density of the eigenvalues at zero, which means color symmetry breaking. So our claim is that color symmetry is breaking here at the gross within value point. And in terms of the uh, size of the confined sector M, color symmetry breaking takes place here. And this is unstable saddle in the case of uh, uh, pure ion bills. This is what we confirmed numerically. And in the case of QCD, we don't have a explicit result yet. But the natural conjecture is that uh, at the zero temperature system is completely confined and there is a partially deconfined uh, phase, which is stable in a real world QCD. And then there is color symmetry breaking here. Okay, so this is my last slide. So we argue that uh, partial confinement or partial deconfinement takes place at large end. So this kind of structure appears. Okay, so confined sector, confined sector and the deconfined sector coexist in the space of color. And to characterize it, we use only gauge symmetry. So we don't need color symmetry, we don't need center symmetry. And this is generic feature of large energy theory because our argument based on the analogy to Bose Einstein condensation didn't use any detail of gauge theory. But if we focus on, say, pure mills, then linear confined potential in a confined sector can be observed. So this is actually related to uh, confinement in a more dynamical sense. And this partial confinement triggers color symmetry breaking. And I didn't explain, but uh, when theta angle is pi, CP symmetry can be broken in a confined phase. But then in this case, again, CP symmetry breaking takes place at the gross width and value point. So they, they, they are literally, gross width and value point is literally uh, uh, the onset of the uh, uh, confinement. And the way, uh, how much of the things we uh, observed here can be uh, generalized to finite end? At this point, we don't really know, but uh, I'm very optimistic. And one of the reasons that we used global symmetry is that color symmetry breaking is well-defined notion, even not finite end. And uh, when we have a center symmetry, for example, a uh, 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 hydrogen transition can be characterized as uh, by breaking of a center symmetry. And gross with the transition, couldn't be uh, characterized by uh, uh, center symmetry, but uh, it was related to global symmetry. And the gross symmetry transition does not uh, uh, generalize, does not have an uh, obvious counterpart at finite end, but the global symmetry breaking has an obvious counterpart at finite end, of course. So I would say in some concrete examples with the global symmetries, 
partially defined phase is characterized as the center breaking color breaking phase. This is uh, the way we might be able to generate this story to finite them. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank the other speaker. Okay, questions? Okay. Uh, there is. Hi, um, I have a very basic question. So you mentioned several times that the deconfined phase can, corresponds to a black hole. Now this is probably ah. some dictionary, dictionary but, but is there a simple intuitive way to understand it and in, in what sense is it a black hole? Uh, yeah, so why, why I say this? Okay, so actually it's related to this picture. So I say that in deconfined phase, so deconfined phase would correspond to, uh, you know, so this is a Wilson loop, which is a trace of uh, many link variables, would be would be like it's a closed strip, okay? And in deconfined phase, we have many Wilson loop acting on this uh, gauge brand ground state, and the length is like square of this size, you know, M square. So it would mean a very long, so very long string condenses. That's the confined phase. But in, uh, in if we and we can uh, intuitively we should identify this long uh, QCD string and the fundamental string in a gravity side. So in gravity side, a lot of long fundamental strings are condensed, but those long fundamental strings are black hole. And a short string is graviton, long string is black hole. And if you further uh, want to relate it, uh, there's a nice argument by uh, Saskin or Horowitz and Porchinsky. But intuitively, probably you can say that if you have a long string with uh, you know, a lot of uh, winding, first, because it's long, a lot of energy is there. And if a string is long, and then it can have a complicated shape. So a lot of entropy is there. And if you put a lot of entropy and energy in a very small spatial volume, you get black hole. That's how the confinement and the black hole are related. Okay, thank you. There is one more question. Oh, Andrew? Hi, Masanori. Hi. In, is it you showed that the degeneracy of your states grew as the exponential of n minus m squared. Is that correct? Uh, here. Yes. Yeah, so, so I so I don't have explicit uh, uh, formula, but intuitively it's like this. So here, so here, so we have a generic uh, element of SU n minus m, right? And the number of generators is n minus m square. And each generator can have a certain uh, range. So, okay, so, 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 so it's, so the, the range of the, you know, it's an exponential of the linear combination of the n minus m generators and uh, n minus m squared generators. Exponential of the uh, linear combination of the generators would be group element. And we have n minus m squared uh, uh, generators. And each of them can have some uh, uh, range of the values. So it's a, uh, uh, so I said exponential, but I don't know exact question to you. But from dimensional counting, exponential of something times n minus m squared is natural scaling because of the dimensional counting, because uh, we have uh, n minus m squared dimensional space. So, so if I can, if one can establish that the degeneracy is not of that form, that it is not a function of n minus m, does that uh, contradict your? Uh, I think so. Yes, yes. If you can say that, if you can say this enough uh, scaling. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, Thank but you. maybe uh, the detail of this uh, no, no, small dependence of n 
in uh, you know we, we should have some coefficient here and small dependence of m may not change argument too much sure. but like like uh, it, it, why we see confined phase that's because it, you know entropy exponential n squared entropy of the confined phase that has to beat exponential n squared generacy factor coming from SUM. That is, so just looking at the completely confined phase and the confined phase, probably you can estimate this quotient, I think. Or there must be some mathematical <laughs> relation. So maybe you can kill this argument. Yeah. Okay, now we have an online question. Uh, by John, please. Yeah, okay, thank you. So you said at some point that um, you found a linearly rising potential, uh, but how can you get such a behavior from the, the confined sector of the Wilson loop? Uh, in the confined sector, you don't see exponential decay. So how did you define the Wilson loop in this figure? In this figure, so we have a deconfined product of, deconfined product of loop is some of these phases. And uh -huh. the confined product of loop is the sum of these phases. Uh -huh. Okay, so we have this splitting. Yes. And this part has a uniform distribution. Yes. This part has no uniform distribution. And uh -huh. we took the two point function of this part. Oh, two point function. We, ah. So I, we I, did, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. This is two point function. So this is one product uh, of loop. This uh, is okay. another product of loop. And distance is L. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, and se uh, separation to the confined sector and the confined sector is crucial. Otherwise, you don't see this uh, exponential decay. So what happens if you calculate the two-point correlation function for the deconfined sector? You don't see... Uh, it goes to constant. Almost constant. Yeah, so it's a perimeter law. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And another interesting thing is the two-point function of the confined wall loop and the confined loop. And mm -hmm. in that case, actually, we can uh, theoretically argue that we see exact same exponential decay mm -hmm. as a confined confined correlator, mm -hmm. and we can confine that. We can check that. Uh -huh. I see. Okay. I understand. Thank you. There are no further questions. Let us thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and we move on. Our next speaker is Rita Fiorezzi, and she will speak about quantum Minkowski superspace. I will show you 10 minutes. Okay, I'll get my. Last time I, I was able to cover on half of my talk, so this time I wanted to bring a better job. So, okay. Right. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. How do I advance? Okay. Perfect. No? This one? Okay, perfect. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay I can start. All right, so first of all, I want to thank the organizers because this has been a great, uh, uh, really a great event and uh, I'm having a lot of fun, but uh, again, because it's a beautiful and uh, interesting uh, meeting. So uh, this is going to be more on the side of uh, non-commutative geometry. So there will be very little physics, practically nothing. So I want to excuse myself to start with, I'm a mathematician. <laughs> Okay, so this is the plan of my talk. So I plan to give some uh, very, uh, what can I say, very humble motivation in the sense that I'm a mathematician, I'm learning uh, all of these things from physics and I try to motivate. Then I will explain the uh, construction of the ordinary Minkowski space as the big cell in the Grossmannian 
which is an interesting uh, algebraic geometry object of uh, uh, vector subspaces in a given vector space. I will explain everything. Then I will generalize the, the Minkowski superspace. And of course, I want to do the quantum Minkowski superspace and talk about quantum Riemannian geometry and supergeometry. So this has been uh, an ongoing uh, um, adventure. So let me put uh, a bit uh, of a bibliography, which is, of course, absolutely partial. Uh, I am sure that I'm leaving out a lot of people and I excuse myself. But certainly, if you look into this book, uh, The Minkowski and Conformal Superspaces, we have a, a very uh, thorough bibliography. And I'm sure that there you can find lots of reference of all the people that have been working on this. Uh, I must say that the most influential book that you should at least open is the one by Manning, Gauge Field Theory and Complex Geometry. I don't think there is any physics into it, but uh, it's, there, there is a very authoritative treatment of super geometry and the Penrose approach to the uh, Minkowski space and the super space in this way that I'm going to explain where the action of the super or ordinary Poincaré comes very, very naturally. So this is an idea due to Penrose explained by Manning in this book, Gauge Field Theory. Then, of course, there is the book on topics on non-commutative geometry where Manning does everything. Uh, so this is another good source. And these are the works that uh, I've been uh, doing more recently uh, with uh, many people. I mean, three people are sitting here. So they know already what uh, I have to say. Please feel free to stop me anytime. I'll be very happy to explain. So let me go very, very briefly on some motivation. Why studying quantum groups? So the quantum groups and called the quantum symmetries. So we've been hearing about coordinates that do not commute today, right? So the fuzzy sphere, uh, we've been hearing about the Minkowski space where you know the coordinates do, do not commute that's the same idea so we wanted to uh, define a, a model for the minkowski space for the moment just a flat one uh, for curvature I, I say something later on metric and so on uh, where the uh, the coordinates are not coming from a commutative ring but they have some form of non-commutativity maybe a non-commutativity which is mild when i'm talking about Super Minkowski is just a Z2 grading, so they'll come with a minus sign. I will say something more, but very, uh, it's, it's not only about super, today is about quantum also. Uh, but this object, the Minkowski, for me, it's not so interesting if you don't put together an action of a group, in particular the Poincare group. Okay, so for me, any deformation that you may give to an object should come together with a symmetry. And this uh, quantum symmetry is something very vague that I'll try to make more precise later. And of course, what are you aiming? You are aiming to some form of quantum Cartan geometry. So you want to understand not just the action of the group period. You want that some metric arises spontaneously out of it. Uh, this uh, concept of quantum Cartan geometry has been done. I have uh, references later on, been attempted, but it's not done at all yet. So it is uh, uh, the interest of uh, many people. And then towards this is the last uh, commutative, non commutative supergravity. Who knows? This is uh, uh, yet to come. I know many physicists are working on this. Uh, but we mathematicians come later, right? <laughs> we come later and we try to uh, make sense of a theory that uh, was described. So what is it? You, you claim you did everything, I'm sure. <laughs> I am very sure. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very funny, right? That, uh, okay. All right, so let's uh, take uh, uh, the point of view of the description of the ordinary Minkowski space. Well, so the, what do we expect? So we expect that we get four coordinates, at least this one we expect, and uh, there is some action. So uh, let me, uh, I put down this because in the hope, uh, but for me, a mathematician, this makes very little sense, but perhaps for a physicist, this is reassuring, right? I don't know. Okay, so, uh, what is the group that you want? So the, 
the conformal Lie algebra or the conformal group as you pre, as you like. There will be translation, dilation, the Lorentz transformation, the special conformal transformation. So first of all, I must uh, before I I go to a more mathematical description, I must uh, um, give you a disclaimer that is I know physicists really like uh, real objects, and you say of course I like real object. I mean because this space is real, yes. But as a mathematician, I like complex ones a lot. Why do I do this? Because I'm a lead theorist. And in lead theory, if you have already complex, life is much easier. Okay. So the approach that I'm taking is that I look at the complex objects. What is it? I like complex. You like a complex. I'm glad. So that is perfect. I am glad that we are on the same page. Wonderful. So I'm, I'm looking, so the, the way I reach the, re, because in the end I want the real door. I want the real Minkowski space, okay? So this is, so what I will do, I will define complex objects and then involutions on this complex object and the fixed points will be the real, okay? So this is the idea. Okay, so let's go to this uh, Perros manning approach I am sorry, I should, I'm a physicist. This is a slide coming from math conference. I should say Perros, right, only because Manning came later and, uh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> right, right, see, because if I say Perros, uh, uh, Perros at the math conference, they like it less. So, so there is this approach uh, to complex conformal and Minkowski space, which is the following. So your complex Minkowski is of course C4. So a four dimensional complex space, but it's not just by itself. You want to see it in a bigger space, which is the Grassmannian of two planes in a four dimensional vector space complex, okay? This object is projective, okay? So it's not an affine variety, no, it's not is a complex projective variety, which means that if you try to describe it as C infinity, don't succeed very well, okay? So, and uh, this is obtained as SL4C modulo this Q, which is a parabolic. These are two by two matrices. So Q is a four by four matrix with these blocks. There's a zero right here, two by two. Now, for example, think, you may think, uh, uh, well, if you look at SL4, C, this is uh, what is called the conformal group. Because when you try to look at its Lie algebra, you will reconstruct uh, all of these uh, symmetries, okay? This is a simple exercise. You uh, discover that there are brackets and you prove that these brackets indeed are the same as the special linear group in four dimensions, okay? So being a mathematician, I really like this object for many reasons. It is complex, just to start. And then it is a simple group. If you know what it is, great. If you don't, it's okay. Modulo what is called the parabolic. This is a, a nice structure, it's a well-known structure. And again, if you're familiar with Cartan geometry, you know that this is really, really something you like, but okay, if you don't. Now, the good thing about this picture that is due to Perros is that you can encode naturally the symmetries of the Poincare group. How you do it? You look at this uh, subgroup. So see, this is a subgroup of SL4 because you put, uh, essentially you just uh, turn off uh, the right uh, uh, upper left coordinate and you make it, uh, and you act by just matrix multiplication on this uh, IA, why do I write it like that? I should have written a bit more carefully. So this should be a four by four matrix. This is zero and this is I. I forgot to put it because it's not important. But uh, the point is that you have equivalence classes right here. So any object that you know, you know it up to an element in this group. Anyway, what is really interesting is that you can encode the action where this is a two by two matrix that is identified with your Minkowski space and you, you act on this group with this group element and you obtain this other. Now, it is, I think uh, it is clear that this picture 
this is just uh, you know similar to a joint action almost and then you have a translation so it is almost uh, uh, what you would like to be the poincare group but uh, not quite it's complex poincare now this is your uh, uh, nice uh, uh, complex expressed in Pauli matrices. I know I put it, I personally don't care very much, but I know you guys like it a lot. So I put it here. Uh, now, uh, in this approach, you want to reach a real form. Now you can show that the real form for the Poincaré is this, where you take, you see the, um, instead of L, sorry, L and R, you take R equal to uh, the adjoint to the minus one L, and you find a more familiar picture. Now, uh, I know that uh, the Poincaré that you're used to is SO13, but uh, one of these magic uh, of uh, Lie algebras, you can show that uh, this uh, uh, algebra SL2C is isomorphic as a real Lie algebra to this SO13. There are many low dimensional isomorphism. This is one of them. Okay. Now I know it's a bit deceiving that I write SL2C as real Poincare because you think, no, wait a moment, this is SL2C. No, you have to think of SL2C as a real group. So your complex is uh, like an R2. Well, this is, uh, if you open book uh, of Algerson, it's full of this low dimensional. Yes. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> I see you are very prepared. I'm glad. So, yes, of course, this is the spin cover, you know, this. I didn't want to get into these technicalities, but thank you. They're not so important for today. Okay. So, uh, and then you get this beautiful action. Now, what is interesting about this action is that. Uh, it is clear that apart from this translation factor, the determinant is preserved. So in the idea that uh, morally Poincaré should be the Lorentz group times uh, translation, right? The semi-direct product, you see that uh, this behave like uh, the Lorentz because it will preserve the determinant of A, which is the metric. You see, when you take a, a two by two um, a complex matrix and you view it as real, uh, you see that this is, so you're looking at a real form, you see that the determinant is preserved. I personally like very much uh, uh, Perro's idea, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, a, a very fruitful and interesting point of view, because in this business, if you view the Minkowski as a sub, uh, as a big cell inside the Grassmannian, the action of the Poincaré will come for free. One thing, you know what, I've been happy with the action of Poincaré up to today. You tell me there is another method, who cares? I know you care. Because if you want to quantize, if you want to generalize, then you need, what you do, you deform the bigger structure and automatically you get the deformation of the Minkowski dragging the action together with it. So this, uh, in fact, the Perros uh, was thinking about also non-commutativity, but uh, this is, uh, I'm going too fast on this point. Okay. So I'm trying to, this was done by Panos many years ago. This is not. Uh, so now what we're going to do is going to see a generalization. So um, what is uh, the word super? The word super is very simple. It just means that your coordinates do not commute. So X, Y is not equal to Y, X. No, there is a sign. So if you take two even coordinates, they commute. If you take even and odd, they commute. But if you take two odd coordinates, there is a minus, like exterior algebra. It's very, very, it is really like that. This is a, for the Minkowski, perhaps if you do more complicated object, uh, no. But uh, for, Minko, for uh, uh, Minkowski, yes. So <clears throat> for n equal one supersymmetry, there is what is called the best Zumino complex uh, conformal superalgebra is SL41. Now, uh, what you have typically when you're looking at super objects is that when you forget about the odd part, 
which means, uh, see, there is a convention. I, I am sorry if I'm saying obvious things, but I, I like to say things so that anyone can uh, follow. So in a super uh, context, uh, when you use Greek letter alpha, beta, you mean they're odd. They're taken from an exterior algebra. So they do not commute, they anti-commute. So when you eliminate alpha, beta, so if you set them equal to zero, these two coordinates, you retrieve SL4 here, and then this other C. So it is kind of strange if you look at this picture, because you're like, if I want to go to a generalization, I would like to have my generalization to coincide with the uh, SL4 C. It's a sanity check, right? When there is no supersymmetry, I'd like to go back to the conformal group. But it's not like that. This is a discovery by, Ves, perhaps not Vesumino, someone, I forget. There is a discovery uh, that uh, if you, you cannot construct uh, an interesting algebra, a simple algebra, whose even part, so when you forget about the odd coordinates, is exactly SL4C. You cannot do it. You have to introduce this extra factor is a part of the theory. Now, what it turns out that the, what is it? Is a central extension, correct. Ah, see, I am too easy. I have to do things more complicated. <laughs> okay, no, but of course experts, I'm, I'm sorry. So uh, this is the even part, SL4, and then this uh, element, and then there is the odd part. Now, the odd part, will be a four-dimensional representation of SL4C, and it will turn out to be a spinorial representation. So with a lot of physical uh, meaning. So this, for me, mathematician, is a representation, but uh, okay. So this is the setup. Now we want to uh, understand what are the real forms, right? So the real forms we obtain by looking at an involution. So uh, I've, uh, recently written a paper on involutions of uh, uh, super uh, Lie super algebras. And to be honest, uh, there are quite some surprises into this theory. So it's not what you think. You say, oh, I do a real form, I just look at an involution. Uh, many strange things will happen, okay? So when you try to look, uh, I'm just uh, advertising my other more mathematician work. If you are familiar with the theory of Cartan decomposition, this is not as easy for super. The, because the involution becomes not involution, becomes order four. If you insist of having an order two, some strange things happen. But uh, so uh, the, if you're curious, read my work is <laughs> on the internet. So, but whatever, this is uh, very easy for us. So we just look at this uh, involution and we look at these uh, fixed points. And uh, this is the model for the uh, real uh, conformal uh, group. Uh, now, this is a bit uh, different that you expect. You get a SU22. Uh, I don't have the time to explain why that and not another. It has some nice properties. And then you can look at the global. I really have uh, no time to explain how uh, to make sense of the concept of supergroup because it takes too much time, but uh, it's just the analog, the global analog of uh, superalgebras. Superalgebras are Li superalgebra with a bracket, uh, preserving the parity, doing some interesting things. And the supergroup is just the uh, analog, the global analog of this object. So it's uh, okay. Now, and similarly, you can produce a real Poincaré and the real po both algebra and group. They're kind of ugly. And while I was reading it before, I realized that I put an extra minus one here. But if I didn't tell, you would not have noticed. <laughs> I just made a mistake, but this is not uh, so important. This is to tell you that this theory doesn't have just the complex, but also the real. Okay. And now comes the Minkowski superspace. Now, if you remember what I said at the, right at the beginning, I said, well, we do SL4 divided by parabolic. Can I write perhaps here? Because uh, uh, so to remind us what was before, can I write? Yeah. So it's, uh, so the Minkowski 
as C4, we wrote it was SL4 modulo sum parabolic, something like that, the Q parabolic. So this is four, four, of course. Now here you say, okay, this was the Grassmannian of two spaces in a four dimensional space. Now the point is that here you say, oh, okay, you know what? Uh, I do the Grassmannian of uh, uh, same, but it doesn't work. So uh, what you have to do, you cannot uh, just take uh, two dimensional spaces. So here, because if it were you and me, we think, uh, but we're not pair, oh, sorry, we're not perros. So we think something along these lines. That would be the obvious generalization. I made something here. Sorry, I'm unable. Right. So we would take some vector here. So this will be what I denote like this. And then it will be inside a four one dimensional space for even and one odd dimension. Okay, but that's not good. If you try to do this, as I will comment later, you can, mathematically, you can look at just at two zero spaces, but you wouldn't get a real form. That is the problem. So in order to get a real form, you need to add some other spaces. You need to add, this is the discovery of Penrose, so you have to look at the two one space. So it is a flag. So flag, what is a flag? A flag, you need to look at subspaces, two zero subspace inside the two one subspace inside the four one. So they become a more complicated object. And in fact, this is what is called the Penrose twister. And there will be a relation because you want this subspace to be inside this one. So you get a, a twist or relation. Now we express it this way to uh, change coordinates, and then we uh, construct the action of the super Poincaré. I didn't write, but uh, this is the coordinates for the super Minkowski, and then you go uh, to the um, to the action of the Poincaré translation and so on. You can write a lot of formulas and uh, we get a real low Lorentz by imposing uh, these conditions. Okay. Yes. Phi. What is phi? Because I didn't. Uh, so let me go back. So, um, right, it's here. See? So this is the Poincare. So it's like you have an, a, an element of the Poincare group acting on the Minkowski. So this phi will appear. But if you are asking me something which I think you are asking me, where is this phi staying, right? You have to think of it as a Grassmann coordinate, an exterior algebra coordinate. That's not really a true coordinate, right? If you try to evaluate, you get zero. So the usual game of super geometry. I guess this was your question, I'm sorry. So it takes a long time to go, to go carefully and I wanted to give ideas more than... Uh, all right, now we are not uh, uh, happy with this in the sense that uh, we, um, I still have 10 minutes, right? 10, 10, 15. Okay, let's go with 15, because, oh boy. Okay, so what I want to do now is to want to put an extra layer. And the reason is that, oh, why are you telling us this uh, all the purpose of my talk is trying to show to you how Perro's idea is especially suited to be generalized, to be um, encoding symmetry naturally. This is the point. Now, when you try to get a quantum object, the game is the following. You have your object, for example, oops, sorry. For example, you take a complex Minkowski with four even and one odd, two odd, it depends, symmetries, uh, dimensions. You replace your Minkowski space with the ring of polynomial on the Minkowski. You may think, why are you taking the polynomials? Why don't you take this infinity? Yeah, of course, you could take this infinity. I prefer to take the polynomial ring because I'm personally used to algebraic deformations. And for this reason, I take uh, polynomial. 
Then you take the complex Poincaré, and I replace it with the algebra of polynomials on these groups. This is the special linear and the translation. Now, if you play this game of replacing a geometric object with uh, its uh, uh, ring of functions, which, by the way, this is a philosophy that was brought along by Grothendieck. This was back in the 60s, where you forget about your uh, geometric object. You look only at the functions, uh, but I'm sure you all know this uh, uh, very important picture. You have to replace the action with the co-action. So it's kind of the dual space picture, right? So this is the arrow going one way. You take the dual picture, look at the function, and the arrow will go the other way, right? Like when you have a manifold morphism, then the function go the other way. It's, it's a very understandable. Oops, sorry. And when you look at the, uh, the word the quantum, I'm thinking of uh, taking C together with some Q. Q you may think it's e to the h, meaning h is very small quantity, and q is close to one. Or you can think of it as an indeterminate. If you ask me, I'm a mathematician. For me, it's an indeterminate. But it can be also specialized to a number. So the functions in M, so it has coordinate x, y, z, t, they do not commute. They commute almost up to some Q. And there will be relations that are purposefully, I don't write. We can write a very explicit relation. I will explain. I, I don't think it's useful to write all these relations. Now, what is the idea that we have? Now, our friend Manin produces this ring of deformation of SL4. Actually, to be really honest, this quantum group business constructed this ring. First, I think was Rishetikin, Taktajev, and Fadiev, the first people doing this. And then Manin rewrote that paper, uh, de deriving all these relations, not through the R matrix formalism that was these people do, but through a group theoretic approach where you construct this ring straight from uh, uh, like uh, coaction uh, reasoning. So you have an action, you want coaction. What is it? No, you are saying, uh, let's go to happy hour. Yes, yes, me too. You did. I am so sorry I didn't quote you. I, uh, I apologize. Uh, but you, you send me your paper, I will be so happy next time to quote you. Please do. Okay, I, 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 I asked forgiveness before I started. Okay, so what, uh, by, by the way, you and other thousand people, the former Minkowski, eh? we are in a big group. Eh? Eh? <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are in good company. Okay, so uh, our friend Manin give a deformation of the conformal supergroup and then heuristically, what you can do is say, oh, you know what? Let's write this as a multiplication of matrices, which is something very crazy because this is no matrices, right? You think of it as generators. And if you try to do this uh, uh, operation, which is only heuristic because there is no mathematics, you discover that uh, uh, this coordinate T and tau Take this aspect. It's, it's really like you multiply and find out what they look like, okay? Where this dij are quantum determinants, this will take you kind of an afternoon because this is a bit tricky, but okay, you do this. Now, the, the very interesting thing here before we keep going, there is a minus one. When you're in the quantum world, inverting something, if you ever tried, is something very painful and requires something called the or condition. I don't go with what it is, but I'm saying that's not as easy as in the non-quantum world. And we are also in the super setting, so you have to be careful in many ways, but uh, one can do this. The next thing you should uh, wonder when you write like this, I write it purposefully in a matrix form, is that, okay, I am happy. I can derive the Minkowski because I identify it with the translation group in the Poincaré. But what are the relations? So what are, so these are non-commuting variables. Yes, yes. 
there is no reason why this variable should have any meaningful commutation relation. And the surprising thing, at least for me, very surprising, is that they do. They will have the same commutation relation as the Manning matrices. And this is uh, something, you know, I, I've been in this business long enough. They want something very complicated as an easy uh, commutation, as, as an easy formula. It means you are on the right track, right? Because everything beautifully uh, matches the, what you think it should be happening. So indeed, uh, you get this. And uh, you always verify because of this nice commutation relation, because see, you say, oh, Rita, this is not difficult. I just give this definition. Yes, you can give this definition, but you have to show that this is well posed, that the commutation relation will go to zero eh? because it's an algebra map. They should behave nicely. Uh, you can prove that uh, this is because this is a very simple commutation relation and you can give a coaction of the super quantum Poincaré. This uh, I'm uh, just omitting a lot of calculations that uh, again, one can have fun doing. And uh, at this point you can build the, the Minkowski as a big cell in the quantum uh, uh, Grassmannian. Now, the problem is that, uh, as I said, that that's not the right thing to do because you want to get into the flag. If you try to get into the flag, it becomes really, really very complicated. Uh, so, and we are working with Yedo and Razak, my student. We've written this paper, we plan to do more, but it's, uh, so the, it's conceptually is not difficult. You know what you have to do is computationally, it becomes impossible. So we're trying to find some strategy. I just want to uh, very briefly um, tell you, yeah, this is uh, uh, the obstacles in generalizing. I, I said it, but I also wrote it. Uh, the point is that the flag is not a projective supermanifold, uh, very differently from the uh, non super setting, these objects that are very nice, uh, like Grassmann and flags, are not projective in general, very annoying. And uh, even when you look at n equal one, the super ring is becoming complicated. Um, with uh, Yedo, uh, Latini, and Nadal, we tried uh, an indirect uh, uh, definition via quantum section in the super context. I wrote a couple of slides, perhaps uh, I can uh, not uh, tell you what it is uh, and go directly to what I think you may be most interested, uh, quantum Riemannian supergeometry. I will say a few words. So uh, any very important concept uh, when uh, trying to define uh, distances is I have in this metric and we have already available a quantum determinant uh, uh, to try to define a metric. The next thing is that we want a, like a super Riemannian metric and the quantum Berezinian seems uh, to be the natural candidate. The Berezinian is uh, the equivalent of super determinant. You want to do differential calculus on this object. You want to look at principal bundles to connection curvature and also to quantum gauge field theory that Aschieri gave a very nice talk in Bologna just a week ago. You want to be doing all of this in the quantum and in the super setting. This is only wish because nothing has been done and we need young people that want to do this. So uh, this is what uh, young and less young, of course, that is. Uh... So uh, let me draw conclusions. So we describe successfully super conformal and Minkowski spaces for n equal one but for chiral eh, in the Grassmannian. The Minkowski superspace we try with the flag, with this trick of quantum section, but we are unable to give a full description. We just give a description a little bit, indirect description. That is something we, we would like to do better. The chiral Minkowski is successfully quantized for n equal one and n equal two. Uh, using non-commutative localization, but with a warning, there is no natural real forms. To get real forms, Perros tell us we have to go here to the flag. 
this is more difficult, we're trying, we're working. We've been given a notion of quantum principal bundle. Uh, we want, we are in the process of understanding uh, quantum differential calculus, vector field and connection. This is work in progress with my uh, many collaborators. So this uh, conclusion is actually not conclusion. It's the first passing conclusion. The rest is a wish. So the last one is uh, really a wish. And uh, I end my talk with an advertisement. So I am the main proposer for the action Calista. We've been uh, uh, happily uh, financed by the European uh, Union. And if you can see yourself fitting in any of this working group, please go to this website and join. We'll be most happy to have you. Thank you very much. Questions? So Majid uses this metricity to to for his metric, right? So he has this. Uh, is your super Riemannian metric central? Yes, yes, okay, but wow. this is a work in progress. Uh, this is what my student Ratzak has been doing. He will be talking, I think, tomorrow or the day after. He will uh, be doing this. Yes, we are doing this. It's work in progress. And no results yet. Okay. Yeah. So you don't know it. No, I think it will be central, but uh, we don't have a result. Okay, we did. We haven't proven yet it's a metric. We have a candidate for metric. That's the thing. Okay, but but Najib first using the process to compare it to one. Yes. And on ground. Yes. No, here is different because you have only one central thing, which is the determinant, right? So your hands are tied. Either it is that or it's nothing, right? So it's this is why I'm saying we have a candidate, right? Uh, you are interested in uh, quantum Minkowski spaces and quantum Minkowski superspace. Yes. Conformance. But what is the algebra that would satisfy this, this, the generators? I mean, this, this uh, generators or coordinates. I mean, because this, this is important. It's a basic thing. So essentially, you are telling me I should have had another slide with the generators and relation. You are right. I should have. Yes. But you have at home or not? The algebra? Yeah. Yes, of course we have it. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, okay, so my collaborator, Marianne Yedo, promises she will write it. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> so, so if you wait for her talk, uh, everything will be more explicit. Okay. okay. More questions? Yes. Pedele. Uh, you started with conformal, but then yes. probably I got distracted. At some point, then you became more Poincaré. Yes. Uh, are there uh, novelty, new things, if I were, if you had gone all the way, keeping all the conformal uh, uh, group, in particular so, the special conformal that are the iffy ones? The, so the I decided to give my talk about Minkowski, but of course you can look at the conformal space. That'll be the Grassmannian, right? Okay. So you can say quite a bit about that, but I, I decided not to, okay? It's easier than Minkowski, you are right. The conformal group does not act on R4, it's on Minkowski no, no, space. No, no, So you need a comp compactification. Yes. Ullmann has a proof, that is Ullmann. And Ullmann, Ullmann yes. had a proof that the compactified Minkowski space is exactly U2 okay, as a topological space. Okay. Perhaps. What uh, is it? What is a compactification of this? It's a Grossmannian. Grossmannian is a comp compact object. In that U2 is sitting? I uh, don't see that. Uh, hmm? mm. Must be, but I don't see it. I mean, she did not do any compactification. No, no. Okay, so the Grassmannian is the conformal space. Now, you want to see it, it is topological U2. To be honest, perhaps it is, but I don't see it immediately, this. If but, one makes the uh, two-by-two matrix, permission matrix, yes, and do the transformation, call it H, mm -hmm. and the U2, which Schulman proved, is 1 plus IH over 1 minus IH. Okay. And that is a unitary. That's ah. what is used in the current. In, um, so linear fractional transformation type. 
I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that you can prove is acted on by the conformer group in the correct way. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm taking Pandro's point of view. I'm sure this is equivalent, but uh, I have not seen it before. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. One it's more. like uh, being during an exam. Yeah. Yes. So I ask, ask the question. Uh, you you use the name of Penrose in your considerations, and I agree that if you discuss twisters, then 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 uh, this is the name, yeah. But as far as super extension is concerned, I think Penrose was not so much interested in these things. So I think, by the way, the guy who wrote firstly super twisters is called Ferber, as you might know. I I gave, I gave a disclaimer. The first phrase I said is that I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. So I'm no, thank you for letting me know. I I didn't it's, know. It's 1977. Okay, possibly you are right. I don't know. I I trusted Manning. I trust. Super twist related with Ferber, as twisters are related with Penrose. Okay, I I do not uh, object. Okay, if there are no further questions or comments, we thank Rita once again and then we move to coffee break. All right, thank you. Perhaps to Matema. Since you got more questions, then. No, because it would like to be Okay. Uh, coffee break. Oh. Coffee break ends. Okay. Uh, should I say it uh, like on the speakerphone or? Okay. So uh, please know that the coffee break ends at uh, six four uh, twenty, not six thirty, but six twenty. <laughs>